Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah, you at the Father's house. Check your shame at the door because it ain't welcome anymore. That's a real tool of the enemy, isn't it? Shame. I want to talk to you today. Of course, obviously, it's Father's Day, and the Scripture has a whole lot to say to fathers. Fathers have such a big job. And, and moms, that's not a slight to you. You're part, you I mean, every part of the, uh, of, of the family is very necessary. But God has uh, quite a bit to say to fathers. He holds we fathers very accountable for everything in our family and for the functioning of our family. And he says he has a great deal to say about fatherhood and family. And it, uh, it usually blends over and, 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 and mails into both parents and mothers and fathers and what they do. And some of the scripture that I've been reading, it, it's so funny, guys, because uh, some, of, some of the people out that are watching out there, uh, I was their pastor many, many years ago for many years. Some of them I've never even met. They've only watched us here. A lot of you guys. Uh, have been here for 10 years or less, something like that. And, and so what I'm saying is that I've been preaching for about 44 years, 43, 44 years. So that means I preached on a lot of Father's Days, is what I'm saying to you. And, um, and of course, like Easter's and Christmases and Mother's Day and other times where you really seek to find something in the Word that uh, would relate to that special time. Uh, most of the time, you, you do that. And so I've done that many times through the year. So as I was studying, a couple, starting back a couple of weeks ago, I started looking at some passages that are just really common for uh, mother messages, father's messages, family messages, marriage messages. Uh, and it's a passage in Ephesians 5. And Ephesians 5 is a chapter that's written about, about relationships. And it's written about our relationship with Christ and our relationship with each other in church. And then it ends with our relationship with each other as man and wife, as, as husband and wife. And how that is a representative of Christ and, and the church. And so the comparison is that like Christ is the head of the church, the husband's the head of the wife. As Christ loves the church, the husband loves the wife. The wife submits to her husband because she submits to, he submits to Christ. And so it's just, it's just whole back and forth of relationship based on Christ. And as I was reading that, for some reason, it's just never really hit me what that well, the depth of what that's talking about until, until now. I, I know, you know, that you guys are not ministers like Bill sermons and messages, so you, you, you're not, you haven't been doing that for 40 years, and so you may not be aware of the fact that in these days that we're in now, and, and I would say really within the last couple of years, it has just been, to me, um, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. That's what Jesus said. And he will lead you into all truth, is what, is what Jesus said. So anything that we need to know about, it's the Holy Spirit that, that makes us aware of it and leads us to understand it and to know the truth of it. So I think over the last couple of years, I've just never seen such a time where the Holy Spirit is revealing so many intricate things. And, and I say that humbly about it because being in the ministry for 43 years, you know, you'd think, well, you'd probably pretty much have most all the information you need about the scriptures and different areas and blah, blah, especially stuff that you preach on a lot, like Father's Days and so forth. But the fact is that God reveals, God's word is so rich and it has so many facets to it that I, I don't think, it's just like John, the gospel of John said about writing the things that Jesus did when he was here on earth. If, if you wrote all the things that Jesus did while he was here on earth, the world couldn't contain the volumes that could be written. And I, I, I'm beginning to see that totally about about insights into the word and, and how they can bless our lives and, and open us up to things that we didn't understand before. It's not that they weren't there before, it's just that 
we didn't see them. The Holy Spirit just didn't enlighten on them. And, and they've been there all along and they, to me, make a tremendous difference. Let me show you one of those things today, all right? I wanna to talk to you about fatherhood and about the effort that it takes to be a great father because it does take a great deal of effort to be a great father. And whether you're a grandfather now or a great grandfather, or you actually have children of your own, Maybe you're preparing for your children to have children of their own, but there are lots of things, lots of ways that you can receive what I'm saying, even if you don't have your children at home with you, where you still are responsible for bringing them up, you know, they're grown and so forth. But anyway, here we go, Ephesians 5, and I'm gonna begin reading at verse 25. This is where it pretty much starts, 22 is where it actually starts, but 25 talks about husbands, here we go. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify, which means set her apart, to, to be set apart, that he might set her apart and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So according to the Apostle Paul, the role of the husband is to be Christ-like and to love his wife as Christ loves the church. So if, the, if, the, if a husband is to be Christ-like and love his wife like Christ loves the church, then that is going to require a, a specific goal. And the goal is not just to be a good husband. The, whole, the goal is to be Christ-like and also love my wife. And as, as I'm, I was reading in verse 25, and I want you to notice, go back, no, go forward one, we have it, there it is. I want you to notice here what, what, what Paul says, very specific. I don't think I'm straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, all right? I don't think this is a point without significance. Look at what it says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Why doesn't it say as Jesus loved the church? I mean, Jesus was more often called Jesus than anything else. Why didn't the apostle Paul say, your husbands love your wife like Jesus loves the church and gave himself for it? I think there's a, a point to this and I think the Holy Spirit said exactly what he wanted to say and I think here's what it is. What's the difference between Jesus and Christ? Well, Jesus is the common name of the Messiah. Jesus means Jehovah is God. So Jesus was the name when he walked on the earth and people saw him everywhere and they'd say, Jesus, Jesus. Well, that was his, that was his name as he walked around and they were respecting Jehovah's salvation. But there were many Jesuses around, by the way. That wasn't an uncommon name. But, uh, but he was Jesus and there's, you know, his name will be called Jesus. Christ, on the other hand, is his title. Christ means the anointed one. So when Paul wrote this, he said, I want, husbands, I want you to love your wife like the anointed one loves the church and gave himself for it. So what does it mean to anoint? Well, to anoint means to smear with oil. And you know, if you were gonna be anointed today, uh, we would just probably take a little dab of oil and put it on the tip of our finger and we, would, and we would rub it on your forehead. But in the day of Christ and in the Old Testament, anointing was a whole different process. So the, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit writing through the Apostle Paul is calling us to, to receive a word that has to do with the anointing and fatherhood. So let me give you the two significant thoughts about how fatherhood and anointing, uh, what significance that has to us as fathers. All right, number one, here's the first significant. 
anointing represents the glory of God. Today, like I was saying, if, you anoint, if, if we were gonna anoint you today, and we used to do this across before COVID and everything, you know, we had people line up across here that wanted to be prayed for. And someone would get a little, uh, a little bottle of olive oil with frankincense or some type of, usually some incense uh, fragrance there. And you'd take a little dab, put it on your finger, put it on your forehead and pray for you. And that's how we would anoint you if you were being anointed today. But in the Old Testament, the way they anointed was they took a whole horn of oil or a whole flask of oil, and they'd, and, and, and they'd break the top off of it, and then they would pour, start at the top of your head, and they would begin to pour that oil on the top of your head, and that oil would flow down your whole face down onto your, down onto your garments, and then it would keep flowing, and it would drip off the bottom of your garments. As a matter of fact, uh, for Psalms 133 describes it, and here's what it says. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, by the way, who was the high priest of Israel, running down on the edge of his garments. And as it ran on the edge of his garments, the little subjugate priest would, would, get, would bend and gather it and then put some anointing oil on themselves that had, been, that had come off the high priest. But there was so much oil, it just dripped. It ran down the body and it, and it dripped. So what was the purpose of that? Well, it was to, to make the body shiny. When the oil would, the reason they poured oil and the oil just completely covered your body is to make you shiny like the oil is shiny. Because the purpose was to reflect the Shekinah, and I don't know if you've ever heard that word, most of you that have been here have, Shekinah just means the outward visible glory. It means that that you can see. It means that brilliant, bright, shining light, that translucent glow that would just, you know, you'd have to turn your eyes, it would be so brilliant. That's the Shekinah glory of God. And anointing was to represent as much as humans could do, the shiny, translucent glow of the Shekinah glory of God. And so what, what, was, what happens when you are anointed is you begin to reflect the glory of God. Now, what does this have to do with relationships? Well, the Apostle Paul continues to talk about this anointing issue and this reflection issue when he talks to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth, that we have two letters, First and Second Corinthians written to, the church of Corinth was a young church. It was full of enthusiasm and full of life and full of vitality and man, they just were hands down going with God. But the only problem they had is they were immature, they didn't know how to work, serve the Lord, they didn't know what to do and they just made a mess out of most everything that you could imagine happening in church. They messed up the Lord's Supper, they didn't, they ate um, food that was sacrificed to idols, they had all kind of problems in the church with men and women and so forth. And the Apostle Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians to, to help straighten them out, to, to help them become, uh, you know, reflective of, of Christ. Well, in, in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church about authority. Now, this passage that I'm about to read is about authority. It's about how to show authority, and they're showing it wrong. And it, it'll surprise you when I, you see the verse. Is it already up there, verse seven? Look at this verse. For a man indeed ought not cover his head. This is talking about authority now. In other words, the men were coming into the church with their head covered with a garment, just like the women were, because they felt like they needed to cover themselves in the presence of God. Now, what Paul is saying to them is, Men, you are not to cover yourself because you are the authority of the church under Christ and the women cover their head because they are under your authority. Look at what he goes on to say. For a man indeed ought not cover his head because he, he's, not, he's the authority there. God's given him the authority. That's his responsibility. Since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Now, let me paraphrase that for you. What that's saying is men reflect the character of the God they choose. 
women reflect the character of the husband they choose. That's what that's talking about. And so if a man serves uh, uh, money, uh, career, uh, social standing, or, or any other false God, if a man chooses that to be his God, his character is going to reflect the fact that he has chosen that to be his God. If he chooses Jesus Christ to be his God, then his character is going to reflect the fact that he has chosen Christ because he's going to begin to, to reflect a Christ-like character, and, the, and, and, and our character reflects the God that we serve. Women who are generally more relational and generally more sensitive to character and motive and emotions, they reflect the image of their husbands who they are responsible to be covered by, by his authority. Let me just give you an example of how this would look in real life, lived out. When Tanya and I were dating many, 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 many moons ago, a long time ago, 40, be 44 years in August, uh, we, but we started dating. We dated for three years. She was 16, I was 18. And we dated for three years, got married 21, 19. And, um, and all of that time that we dated, Tanya was, she was smart, she was talented, she was capable, uh, of course, beautiful, um, all of those characteristics, even when she was 16. The only problem she had was that she didn't have a healthy sense of her abilities and her capabilities and her, her greatness. She, she, she was very shy and she was very awkward about uh, presenting herself in, in any situation like that, although she had the goods to do it. Well, I know that the Lord brings people together and I know, you know, the Lord brought us together. I, and, and, and I knew it from the very start and the Lord spoke, I believe the Lord spoke to me. I believe this is exactly how this got into me because I'm young, I don't know anything. I, I'm, not, I'm not mature in my understanding of the word or anything else. I'm just a young guy that loves her and, and, and that's about all I could say. But the Lord put into, my, into me because he knew I was going to be with her for the rest of our lives. A mission. And he, he drew my thoughts and my understandings to, to understand that my responsibility as her husband was to do everything possible to encourage her to become the woman of God that he had designed her to be. And so over 43 years, I have been working on uh, a person of great value and great abilities and great wisdom and beauty to help her and encourage her to become everything that God had created her to be. And just let me say this to you, after 43 years, she got the picture and she is it. I told her the other day, I said, baby, you, you, you're getting a little too aggressive now. You're going to have to settle down. And she said, well, I'm just what you made me to be. So anyway, the point is, what is Paul talking about when he says that women are the glory of men? Well, that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact, what, what has happened with, with, with Pastor Tanya? Well, she's simply reflecting my character back to me. What I've put in, she's reflecting back to me. And that's what it means for a woman to be the glory of man and for man to reflect back the glory of God. Now, let's go on. In Proverbs 17, the scripture says in verse four, children's children, everybody say grandchildren. Okay, that's what the children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children is their father. When God created Adam and Eve, God put his image in them. And then he told them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. So when God filled Adam and Eve up with his image, which he created them in, he then gave them a command to go forth and to produce offspring 
thereby becoming the image bearer of God to the children. So when Adam and Eve began to have children, the children didn't see the face of God like Adam and Eve saw. They saw their parents and their parents reflected the image of God to them. So we are to be image bearers to our children to reflect the image of God. And if we reflect the image of God properly to our children, then our children are going to reflect that. And if we reflect the image of God improperly, our children are going to reflect that. But let me just hasten to say real quick now that uh, I'm not saying that everything that your children do is your total responsibility because Proverbs 22 says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And it tells you how to get it out too, by the way. Um, but I, I, I'm not, that's not what I'm preaching on today. But I just want you to see that no matter how much you put the image of God, no matter how properly, no matter how great you want it to be, you do everything you possibly can, you can't take responsibility for everything that a child does because foolishness is bound up in the heart. Children do bad things. Children are stubborn. Children have rebellion in them. And they make some poor choices at times. But, but, but what this is saying is that as the greatest influence on a child is going to be the influence of his parents. Proverbs 22 that we quote all the time, train up a child in the way in which he shall go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And I've given you an interpretation of that passage by interpreting the first line, train up a child in the way he should go. I, and I think this is perfectly right, um, although the Lord showed me something else about it, but, but that's just basically saying you should know your children, the bents, the, how they're made, how they're formed, what kind of gifts they have, what kind of talents, abilities, um, what they enjoy in life, what they don't enjoy in life. And as parents, you should, you should be aware of all of that, of your children. You're to pay attention to your children. You're to know these things. And as they begin to move toward life, you begin to train them toward what they should do in life, not what you wanted to do and couldn't get it done. You're not to live vicariously through your children and make them into something that you always wanted to be but never got to be, that you're to know them and you're to push through them and train them in the way they should go so that it'll bless them all of their life. Now, that's if you focus on the first line. If you focus on the second line, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That word old there doesn't mean 75 years old, 85 years old, 65, whatever you think old is. That word in the scripture reflects maturity. So what the passage is saying is, if we train up a child in the way in which they should go, when they, as they become more mature, the training that we put in them is going to come into play into their life. Not, he's not saying, look, if you'll train them up right, and they may go away from the Lord for 55 years, but when they get 70 years old, buddy, they're gonna come back to church. That's not what that verse is saying. That verse is saying that if you train them, whatever you put in them, as they mature, whenever that might be, 20 years old, 30 years old, I mean, we all mature at different ages, but when we mature, the things that we have put into them, God is going to bring them back out of them. So when the Bible says that the children are our glory, what that's saying is that children are more dependent on parents than any other thing to affect the outcome of their life. We can't control everything and we can't make all the decisions for them. And sometimes they choose foolish things because foolishness is bound up in the heart of children. But we as parents are to do everything we can to put greatness in them, to train them, to lead them, to reflect the image of God to them. And God will bring that back. That's, that's the promise that's made there. All right, so that is the first significance of anointing. Let's see the second one. Anointing represents the offices of prophet, priest, and king. All right, now, now hang with me here because this is really, uh, I, I think, I, it's, it's revolutionary in, in, in thinking, in my opinion. All right, there were three offices in the Old Testament that had to be anointed. A prophet, a priest, and a king. All three of those positions you had to be anointed for. 
Jesus came and Jesus fulfilled ultimately all three of those offices. Jesus was the ultimate prophet. Jesus was the ultimate priest. And Jesus was the ultimate king. So how did Jesus fulfill these roles? Now, I'm going to tie me in, but I'm just trying to help you see what prophet, priest, and king's actually all about. And then, and then we'll go into what this means to fatherhood. All right, on the screen, a prophet was responsible for accurately and faithfully delivering God's word. So as a prophet, Jesus was the earthly embodiment of the word of God. There's a theological word used for that, incarnation. He was the incarnation, which means he housed the word in his body. He not only housed it, he was the living word. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Uh, He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus not only gave us the word, Jesus lived the word out before us. As priest, what is a priest? A priest was an intercessor between God and man who was responsible to solve problems, to minister comfort, and to direct relationships. So as a priest, Jesus healed sick people. Jesus did compassionate miracles. All of his miracles that he did weren't just for the show and the flash of a miracle. All of his miracles had a compassionate purpose behind them. Jesus sacrificed his own life so that we could be right with God. Right now, he's in heaven still interceding for us in the presence of God. And he is, according to Hebrews 4, He's a, he's a sensitive and sacrificial priest. You know, he says, for we have not a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we, yet without sin. Therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus was the perfect priest. And what about a king? A king was appointed by God to rule over people as God's representative. As a king, Jesus was a gentle and humble authority figure that washed his disciples' feet and related to humans on a very personal level. His authority was different from other earthly kings because his authority existed for the benefit of others and not for the benefit of himself. All right, how does this deal? How does, what does this have to do with fathers? All right, well, number one, a, a prophet, as a prophet, all right, dad, you are called to be a prophet in your home. You've heard me say before, uh, there, are three, there are three things a father's required in a home, uh, protector, provider, and priest. All right, let me just, let me just give you the aspect of it. There, there are three positions. You're to be the prophet of your home, you're to be the priest of your home, and you're to be the king of your home. And let's see how the anointing relates to that and what that means to us as fathers. All right, a prophet is a man who diligently seeks to hear God's voice and knows God's word for the benefit of his family. Dad, as the prophet in your home, God holds you responsible for hearing his voice for your family and, and diligently leading your family toward what God has said to you. And this includes living a life that is consistent with scriptural standards and values. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna make mistakes. Uh, but it does mean that you're not gonna be legalistic. You're not gonna be overbearing that you are going to be a man of the word and you're going to be responsible for the word being known and followed in your family. Let me show you where, that, where the scripture says that, Ephesians 25. We read it to start with. 
Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. How's he going to do that? With the washing of water by the word. For what purpose? Why, how is Jesus, how is Jesus going to change us? He's going to wash us by his word. Why would he want to do that? Next line. So that he can present her, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jesus washes us with the word so that we can be the glorious representative of him that he has designed us to be. Why would a dad wash his family with the word of God so that his wife and children can be the people that God made them to be? Why? Because sin destroys. The word of God glorifies. So, in the home, God holds us responsible that the word would be presented so that, that our home can become everything God created it to be. And let me just show you the extent it goes to, and I'll do this quickly. This is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter six, all right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Is that not clearly saying that God has given the responsibility for teaching the children to the parents? That's what that's saying? Let me show you how far it goes. Next verse. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. All right, everybody hold your hand up like that and say, this means everything I do. To bind them on my hand means everything I do, I'm responsible for this, for these words, for this, for this touch of God. All right, you can put them down. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. What would that be? Everything I do think. So he's saying, I'm going to, look, you guys, you parents, you're responsible for everything you do, everything you think, and he's not finished yet, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That means that everything that comes into your house has to come through the word. So this is a gigantic responsibility. Parents are the doorkeepers of our homes. And dad, you're the head of the doorkeeping committee. This is, this is the responsibility of the prophet so that everything that comes into my child's life and everything that comes into my home has to come through me before it comes to my wife, my children, or my house. The prophet. I heard uh, a, a long time ago a story about a young man who was wanting to date a young lady for the first time. When he got to the door, she came to the door. She said, uh, since this is our first date, my dad uh, wants to talk to you. And he said, okay, okay. He, he, he's in the den. So the young man goes down the hall to the den and he walks in the room and dad's sitting in his recliner near the couch with a bat, baseball bat in his hand. He's just kind of rolling it like that. He said, come, come on in, son, sit down. Sit down right here. He said, um, since this is your first date with my daughter, um, I just wanted to let you know what my rules are. And uh, he picked up his bat, and written on his bat were all the rules for the daughter. He said, number one is you will have her home at 1030 sharp or before. Number two is you will be kind to her and treat her with respect. Number three, you won't take her to bad places or around bad people. And he just kept reading those rules off that baseball bat. When he finished, he said, all right, son, do you understand my rules? Yes, sir. Will you obey my rules? Yes, sir. 
All right, I'll see you at 1030 tonight or before. Uh, don't be late, don't be late. So they went out on their first date and they had a great first date. Everything went fine. He obeyed the rules. He had her back before 1030. So they come, he comes for, the se- for his second date and she meets him at the door and says, uh, all right, you know, uh, let's go. And he said, wait, 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 before we go, he said, I need to speak to your dad a minute. She said, sure, he's back there in the den. And so he went back in the den and he said, sir, can, can I talk to you for just a second? Yes, son, come on in, what is it? He said, uh, I need to ask you a favor. Uh, he said, okay, what is it? And he said, well, my sister is going out on her first date tonight and my dad wants to know if he can borrow your bat. I'm thinking, oh yeah. Now listen, you guys, the age of disclaimers is here. Don't go out and hurt anybody, all right? But that is, that is a representative suggestion. It's a powerful suggestion. What parent, look, parents, you have to pay attention to what's going on in the life of your children. Every physical thing that comes into, the, into their room, what do they have in their room? What kind of items are there? Now, I, I know that we're, you know, we're not talking about spooky and freaky kind of things where you have some demonic something, but, but I'm gonna tell you something that you really need to be, be aware of. There are certain items that children can have that open them up to areas that you don't want them to be opened up into. And they open up spiritual areas and they, and, 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 and they are, uh, they allure, uh, the allure of the occult and other things can, can easily come through these things. Do they have any of that in their room? Well, that, you, got, you got to be responsible. You got to know that. Um, uh, who is it that they choose to be their role models? Uh, what kind of posters do they have hanging on their wall? You go in there and there's a poster, an athletic person, he good, great person, uh, great values, great morals, everything. You know, there's maybe some entertainer, if you could ever find one that had some good values, morals, all that, and, and so forth. All right, fine, fine, fine. You come around here and you, say, and you see a, a poster hanging there and that sucker is rebellious. He's an abuser. He's a sorry example. You, and take that thing off the wall. That, that's not gonna be somebody that you're gonna model your life after. You tear him up and throw him in the garbage can and say, we won't have anything like that on the walls in here. These are the responsibilities of parents. Who entertains them? Who do they like? Who do they respect? Who do they admire? See, these are things that, these are things that, that children um, have in their lives that go fly under the radar if we're not paying attention to what God said. Everything we do, everything we think, everything that comes in our home, we are the doorkeepers of our family. And what kind of people do they hang around? What kind of people do they, do they, do they uh, walk around the halls in school with? Um, what, kind of people do they, what kind of people do they enjoy uh, imitating? See, these are all things that are dangerous and reflect character, or they could be good or bad, but you, you're, it's your job to know. And nowadays, even what's happening, what is being taught at school, you better know that. Uh, it's surprising. Uh, all right, now let's go. That's the prophet, the priest. All right, Dad, you're responsible to be a priest in your home. Priest is a man who sensitively and sacrificially meets the needs of his children. As the priest of your home, you help them deal with spiritual, emotional, relational, and personal issues. That's the job of a priest. You're a pastor to your children. It's what it pretty much boils down to. Let me show you in Ephesians, the next couple of verses, Ephesians 5, 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Now these are instructions to the priest of the home And what the Lord is saying is, just like you take care of your body, you you cleanse your body, you nourish your body, you take care of your body, you know what's going on in your body. Men, just like you do that, you do that for your wife and for your children. That's what you, that's, that's how you love them. Being a father is being a pastor and loving and pastoring your family. 
Hebrews 4 that I mentioned a while ago. Let's, let, me, let me just read it uh, because it, it says something. This is a great uh, passage about being a priest in your home because a lot of people find this very difficult. A lot of people find it very difficult, dads, to be a priest. You, you can be a king pretty good and you can be a prophet pretty good. But this priest stuff is kind of hard for dads. So listen, this is what it's about. In Hebrews 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. By the way, what is our confession? Our confession is we do have a great high priest in heaven and his name is Jesus. So since all this is true, hang on to that confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, that word boldly, and I know I've said this many times, it doesn't mean arrogantly, it doesn't mean brashly, it means telling all. That word means freedom of speech, freedom of openness. Come in there and just tell God anything. And why can we do that? Well, he already knows everything. You're not telling him anything he doesn't know. And he says, look, just come on in here and don't be afraid of what you say to me. This is a safe place. Come boldly unto the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment. The throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we can say anything to God. He knows what he wants for all of us. Nothing's gonna be a surprise for him. And I'm telling you, the safest person in the universe, if you want to frame it that way, for us to be with is Jesus. He is gracious. He is merciful. He loves us. He, he, he doesn't want to put down on us. He doesn't want to bring down on us. We have a friend in heaven, and that friend's name is Jesus. That's what, that's what Paul's telling us in Hebrews. Now, Tanya and I, when our children were, were born and when they were growing up, we wanted to be our children's safe place. And by that, I mean, we strategized and we talked and planned so that we were going to be parents that our children could come and talk to about anything. And if, you're gonna, if that's gonna be your goal, let me tell you the first thing that's gonna have to not be true, <laughs> when they come and tell you something, you can't blow up. I mean, you can't just get beside yourself, you know, you, like, what? I told you, I, I mean, just, if you do that, they're not gonna come to you, you know? So you gotta, if you're gonna be their safe place. Now, here's what, we, here's what I mean by safe place. I don't mean that we don't get on to them. I mean that we listen to what they say, we consider what they say, we pray about what they've said, we, we discuss what they've said, and then if we need to come down, we can come down but we don't just automatically come down on every little thing as if it's the end of the world simply because they told us something that surprised us or something we didn't like. Now, how successful were we with this? Uh, probably not real successful. Uh, I mean, it wasn't because we didn't want it. It was because they, like most children, didn't tell us everything. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I thank the Lord every day that my children didn't ha grow up in the day of cell phones because I don't know, let me just say something to children. I don't know if any child is watching or you guys listen. I, anything, <laughs> anything that is done electronically can be found. Let me just tell you this. Anything you send in a text message, a Snapchat or a rat flick or whatever all those other things are, somebody can find it and they will find it and you are going to be in big trouble and you're going to destroy things, especially yourself, relationships, your family. I'm telling you, it's a work of the devil. I mean, I feel like oh, uh, on the water boy, oh, what's his name? <laughs> it's the devil. The, 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 the guy, the mama, it's the devil. Everything was the devil. I tell you, it's the devil. Well, it is because I'm telling you, people are just ridiculous. They write terrible things, horrible things, malicious things, evil things, and then they don't think anybody's going to find it. 
and a parent picks up the cell phone, opens the text messages and finds out they hate their guts and they wish they were dead and they're gonna leave as soon as they can get away from them. That's the way teenagers are. Hey, that's the way teenagers are. That's what they think. They're rebellious. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of them. And we don't need to know all of that stuff. I guarantee you, my children probably thought the same thing about me. And if I knew everything they did, they'd probably still be grounded today. <laughs> Justin's 42 now, fixing to be 41, <laughs> fixing to be 42. And Amy's 39. And they still, we still finding out things they did that we're shocked about. So anyway, that is, the, that is the priest part of the home, all right? Um, here's the king, and I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna finish it out because I got a few minutes, but all right. Ver, uh, third, the king. A king is a man who is the servant leader of his home. All right, get the word servant leader, right? You got that. Is the servant leader of his home. He is the initiator of decision-making and problem solving without dominance. No one wants to be dominated. Jesus was a different kind of king. Ephesians 5, the next verse, verse 23, for the husband is head of the wife, also as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. All right, let me say first that men and women are equals. God created us equally. There's no big man and little woman or big woman and little man. God created us equal. We both have responsibilities and we both are held accountable before God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross and there's no black, white, red, yellow, male, female, or any of that kind of stuff. They're only people. And what he's saying here to a family is, women, I have designed you to desire, and I know society tries to beat this out of you on every occasion. I have created you with a desire that your husband be the loving initiator of the well-being of the family. That it is your desire that your husband would be the initiator, the loving initiator, not the domineering bandit, but the loving initiator of the well-being of your home and that anything that needed to be dealt with, that it, he would be the initiator of what it was and how we were gonna do it. And, and that's just the way God designed us. And what this verse is saying here is that just like the church would never think of doing anything without Christ, that a wife would never do anything without her husband. That there would be mutual agreement. That there would be total partnership is basically. I mean, do you think that we as a church would do something that we knew Christ was not pleased with? I mean, would we intentionally go against what Jesus teaches us is right and wrong and what we should do and what we shouldn't do? No, we wouldn't. Well, in just that same manner, he's saying, wives, make sure that you guys are together. You're a wonderful partnership and don't do things, don't act without your husband any more than the church would act without Jesus because you're partners, you need each other. The husband is to be the loving initiator and everything. Jesus is a wonderful king. Nobody minds Jesus being their king. If you know Jesus, you don't mind him being your king because he's not a dominator. He's not a, he's not a taskmaster. He's a loving king in our life. And he speaks to the children in chapter six and he talks to the children about 
uh, about their need in, in verse one. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the promise? Here it is, that it may be well with you and you might, and you might live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. You know what wrath is, right? Wrath is the outward expression of anger. Like, get in that room and don't come out till I say so. That's wrath. That's an outward explosion of anger. Slamming that door. Come back here, don't do it. Backing out of the driveway, throwing gravel or rock. That's wrath the outward expression of anger. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't push them that far. Look, if something's not working, you know it before wrath blows up, right? Do something else. If it's not working, it's not working. You know the definition of insanity, right? Keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Yeah, so if you keep doing the same thing and it's not working, then you can expect it to keep on not working and sooner or later, it's gonna lead to something that you really don't, don't know. But really, what is it that provokes wrath? Isn't it, and, and I'm gonna put a, a psycho, this is not like a super psychological, but it is kind of a, a psychological thought, non-relational authority. What causes wrath in children from their parent? Non-relational authority. In other words, barking at them, uh, putting rules on them, um, being heavy-handed with them without a relationship. Just indiscriminately, and you don't have a relationship, but you're just a heavy. Children need a prophet in the home, someone who seeks out the Word of God, somebody who teaches them the Word of God. They need a priest who loves them, someone that ministers to them, is affectionate with them, and accepts them. And they need a king, someone who brings structure into the home and someone who keeps order in the home. So what's the problem? Well, there's just one big problem. And here it is. Every man is inclined to one or two, but not all three of these roles. Most men are pretty good at one. I mean, they may just be naturally good at it. Uh, their giftings may, may make them great in one of these areas, depending on how the Holy Spirit has gifted them and what motivates them and what person. I mean, you could be, just naturally be great at one of these things. Or you could naturally be great at one or two of these things. But all three, most people find it hard to be good at all three. But remember, children need all three, and you need to be all three. If you're a if if if, if you're a uh, a prophet but you're not a priest, that means you probably can be harsh, and you can be performance oriented, and you can be demanding, but you're not going to be very compassionate. If you're a priest but not a king, it means you could be sweet, but you can be easily taken advantage of. If you're a king but not a prophet. It means you could be dominant, insensitive, demanding, but have no understanding of authority of the word or the spirit of God. Most men are good at one or two, or, or, but not all three. And as a prophet, you lead your family to respect authority. One little incident happened one time. We were at a photography studio many years ago. Of course, um, Tanya's now our photography studio, so we don't have to go to a studio anymore. But we went to a studio, and there was a child, a family that had a child there, and the child would not cooperate with the picture at all. This was like about a three or four-year-old child, would not cooperate. And the child got the idea, and I know you parents know what I'm talking about here. The, parent, the child got the idea that they now had the, ch the parents on the spot because they're out in public and they could do whatever they wanted to because the parent couldn't really punish them out in public. And so they, they had an upper hand. 
That child just didn't do anything. The dad said to the photographer, uh, do you have another room that, that I could use for a minute? The photographer pointed quickly at another room. You're right there. Took the boy in there, uh, convinced him that he wanted to do right. Brought him back, attitude adjustment, brought him back out there and said, all right, now you apologize to him. You've been insulting, you've been rude, you apologize. Little boy apologized to the photographer. Photographer said, in 35 years of being a photographer, that's the first time that's ever happened. But I sure appreciate it. Now, you know what that was? That was the king telling the child that he was going to respect authority and that he wouldn't break that in his home. That, that, that's the king. The prophet, the priest, and the king need all three. All right, so what if you're not all three? How do you get to be all three? And I'm gonna give them quickly, all right? These are just some suggestions. If you are not all three of these and you know you need to be all three of them, how do you get to be all three of them? All right, A, admit your weakness. That just simply means if you're not all three, admit you're not all three. Say, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't know how to be that. I don't know how to be the priest. Uh, I don't know how to be the king. I don't know how to be the prophet. Uh, help me, somebody, you know. I, I need some information about this. I need some help. So you got to, you know, you got to admit it because, uh, and don't be ashamed of it because there are a lot of people that are not all three. All right, B, forgive your father and break family iniquities. Um, iniquity means a tendency towards sin. And if your father had tendencies to be weak in one or more of these areas that, uh, of the prophet, priest, and king, you also are going to have the same tendency to be weak in that position. If you had a father that didn't pay any attention to you whatsoever, that means the priest, he's not, he wasn't a priest to you because he didn't comfort you. He didn't uh, love you. He didn't, he didn't uh, make you understand that you were special in his sight. He was an absentee dad. Well, you're probably not going to be a good priest either. So you need to forgive him and say, Lord, I, I forgive my dad. And remember, forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is for you. You're the one that forgiveness helps. And then uh, uh, forgive your father and then pray and say, Lord, this generational curse, and I don't want that to sound overly dramatic, but that's what it is. This generational curse of, of being a poor priest in my home, in Jesus' name, I want that broken out of my life right now. I reject it. I resist it. I, it is my, a part of my life. No more. You have no authority in my life, devil. In Jesus' name, be gone. Break that. that gener An iniquity means you've been twisted by, by things that have happened in your family and now you, you're not going in the right direction and you're not doing the right thing and you, because you're all twisted up and you don't even know what to do. And, you're, and you've been led to do that for years and years and years, so now it's all twisted up. The only way to get right is to untwist it and, and, and break it. That's, that's, that's an iniquity. All right, C, submit your strengths and weaknesses to the Holy Spirit daily. And I say this because Jesus said in John 16, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit knows all truth. What does all mean, by the way? All. It means math. It means computers. It means rocket science. It means algebra. It means manners. It, mean, it means everything. He knows he is all truth. So whatever truth you need, ask him for it. Holy Spirit, teach me to be a good father. Holy Spirit, I, I don't know how to be a priest. Teach me to how, to be, how to be a priest. Daily, turn that over. I mean, it, He's, he's the answer to whatever you need. Now, he might send somebody along that can talk to you as a human to do it, but that's his choice. 
He may send you a book in the mail. He may, you know, I don't know. He may lead you to a website or what, I don't know what it might be, but he'll get it to you if you ask him for it. That's what he says. D, uh-oh, this one can be scary. <laughs> ask your wife to help you. Ask your wife to help you grow. Now, she's relational. She's sensitive to family issues. I guarantee you, if the children are upset, she's, she knows it. You may not notice it, but she's going to notice it. She knows the temperature of the home. She knows what the family's feeling. She knows the moods, the emotions. She's a relational creature. God's created her this way. Remember, she has a radar dish. You have rabbit ears with tinfoil, right? Okay, ask her. I guarantee you she knows what you are strong at and what you are weak at. Just say, babe, in this, in this, in this prophet, priest, and king, uh, what's my, what are my strengths and weaknesses? Which one am I, am I good at and which ones am I bad at? And you know she'll tell you now, okay? So, and then when she tells you, read the rest of that, and do not be threatened by her input. In other words, you ask her. So when she tells you, don't be offended like she's, uh, like, like she's belittling you in some way. You ask her and accept it and don't be intimidated by that. Look, nobody's good at everything. Just accept that. So don't, when she tells you something, don't be, don't be tempted to fire back at her. Well, you don't do that, you know, just, just be ready for her. All right, so she can help you. E, here's the last one. Find, find, a God, find godly male role models to help you, inspire you, and fellowship with you. Women learn by talking to each other. Men learn by watching each other. And, and when you see someone who's doing a great job at rearing a family, watch them, pay attention. I mean, don't stalk them now. But, but pay attention to what they do and how they do it so that you can see how it's done. And then when, when, when you observe somebody, go over and talk to them, say, hey, look, man, I noticed you, you're a great father. You, you, you're the most loving dad I've ever seen with the kids. Uh, you know, how, how did you do that? What, what do you think about, how do you think when you're, you're doing all that? Uh, did anything help you learn that? Uh, I mean, hey, could you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I, I don't really know a lot about it. Or hey, you know, can we go out to lunch tomorrow? And, you know, and just, just try to develop people in your life that are good at what you want to be good at. By the way, that works in everything. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> don't, don't, get, don't, get, don't have people in your life that aren't good at, <laughs> at things that you don't want to be good at. Get people in your life that are good at things that you want to be good at, and they'll help you be better at the things you want to be good at. All right, all right. That's all I've got for you today. Maybe that's some, uh, maybe that's some, some, some information that'll help you in some ways. Prophet, priest, and king reflect the anointing. We reflect God's anointing. Our wives reflect ours and our children reflect our families. And this is what God intended. All right, bow your head with me. <laughs>